Hey, Dr. Hellman, I'm Mark. I'm an EMR too. We're working again together today, third time this week. Uh, afternoon, Dr. Hellman. Uh, I'm a third year medical student on with you today, and it's my f- first emerge shift ever. Hi, Dr. Hellman. I'm an R5 in EM. We've never worked together, but it looks like today's the day. Hey, I'm here for a shift. Sorry I'm late. Hi, Anton. My name is Hannah. I'm a medicine resident hey, on Anton. with you today. Hey, Anton. I'm Carl. I'm a first-year surgery resident on with you today. Hi, I'm Julie. I'm an obstetrics resident, and I'm on hey, with Anton. you today. Hey, Anton. I'm a pathology resident, and I'm on with you today. As if EDs aren't chaotic enough, many of them are staffed by a revolving door of medical learners. Yet to each of these learners, the ED doc has a critical responsibility to teach. This is a central tenet of what we do, and has been since the days of Hippocrates teaching his two sons. To some, it comes intuitively, but to others, it's the most difficult part of the job. Either way, we can all use some teaching on how to teach. Gone are the days of see one, do one, teach one. By analogy, learning the skills of effective teaching isn't dissimilar to learning how to put in a central line. It takes thoughtful preparation, knowledge, and practice. In this episode, we're going to talk about the how, the when, and the why we teach. We'll hear from two master educators, Amal Matu, no introduction necessary, and Rick Pensioner, who you may remember from his truly outstanding contribution to our episode on presentation skills. We'll discuss the quick, easy tips on how you can take your educating skills from the likes of the teacher in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Bueller. 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 And elevate it to the likes of the Robin Williams character in Dead Poet Society. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. We'll give you the lowdown on orienting the learner and establishing expectations at the start of the shift, or even better, before the shift. Key questioning techniques to use in case presentations. Providing on-the-fly as well as critical incident feedback. The lost art of active observation the one-minute preceptor model, and of course, giving effective end-of-shift feedback, medicine's white whale. We'll look at how to provide and how to receive exemplary teaching, and how on your next ED shift, you can make the most of every teachable moment. Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine from EMC Studios in Toronto. All right. Well, welcome, Dr. Matu. It's great having you up here in Toronto from Baltimore up at the EMU conference, the Emergency Medicine Update Conference. This is what, your 10th year? I don't know, actually. You've lost count, eh? I I, I haven't (laughs) kept track, but it's, it's always one of my favorite conferences to come to. Everyone's super nice. And it's a pretty quick trip and get to see a lot of friends. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you back on EM Cases. Uh, this will be the first time we do a full episode with you. So I've been excited about this for a well, long we've time. We've done one before. Well, yeah, on, we did a, we did a be- your best case ever, which was actually your worst case ever. My worst case ever, exactly. <laughs> okay. And Dr. Rick Pensioner. Rick is a colleague of mine at North York General Hospital, education extraordinaire, master, Welcome, Rick, back to EM Cases. Thanks for having me around, Eton. How are you going to top that, Rick? I I don't think I can. (laughs) Just sign out now. (laughs) All right. Let's jump right into the first case. You're the attending ED doc just about to start your shift. As you sit down with coffee in your hand to review the enormous list of patients waiting to be seen, to your surprise, a young woman in greens comes up to you and says, Hi, Dr. Hellman. I'm an R5 in EM. We've never worked together, but looks like today's the day. So I'd like to start off by asking you both a very simple question, and that is simply, why do you teach? Well, for me, there's a a handful of reasons. Uh, I guess the most practical is it's what we're supposed to do in academics, but there's variable levels of teaching despite the recommendation or requirement. The, The reason I enjoy teaching and the reason I like teaching is because it just makes the shift a lot more fun. It is reinvigorating and kind of refreshes me every time I get to talk about chest pain. I kind of think of it, if there were no student there, I'm sure I would get completely bored at seeing the same chief complaint show up over and over and over. On the other hand, every month there's a brand new set of students or there's off-service residents or different level of residents. And so 
for each of them, every chief complaint is completely new and that makes it new for me also. So every time a chief complaint comes in, it is an opportunity to, to talk about it to a completely new person, see the, hopefully the, the glint in their eyes when they get excited about it. And it, it makes every case just a little bit different. It also forces me to try to keep up with the literature and learn new things. And again, more than anything, it just makes the shift a lot more fun. I, I couldn't imagine working shifts without having students and residents around who are interested in learning about things. Yeah. I mean, for me, it totally keeps me on my toes. Dr. Pensioner, you, why do you teach? So Anton, I'm going to share something with you that I've actually never told anyone else before. I teach for purely selfish reasons. I teach because I love it. I teach because it's fun. It's interesting. It makes me a better clinician. And again, don't tell my residents this, but I actually think that I learn more from my residents and from teaching than they learn from me. Huh, you learn more from your residents. So how does that work? Well, again, as Amal said, you know what? It keeps me current and it really pushes me to stay current in the literature and stay one step ahead of my learners. Yeah. Sometimes uh, residents are talking about the latest study that I didn't get to Twitter quite fast enough. And uh, I'm definitely learning something from them. I agree. So Dr. Pensioner, let's say you've got this senior resident in the case. Uh, you've never met them before. You have no idea what their skill level is. You have no idea what to expect, what they're interested in learning in. How do you kind of start off in this very common situation? You've got this long uh, list of patients that are waiting for you to see. You don't have much time, but you want to kind of set the playing field, so to speak. So I think the first thing that I do with all my learners, whether it's the first day of the rotation or middle of the rotation and I've never met them before, and that is I want to orient the learner. I want to orient them to the department, to the rotation. I want to set expectations. And I want to think about what we refer to as diagnosing the learner. Okay, so let's break down those three things. You mentioned orientation, so orienting the learner, expectations, setting expectations, and diagnosing the learner. So let's start off with orientation. How do, how do you do that? So no matter how busy the shift is, I'm going to take 90 seconds at the beginning. And like I said, whether this is the beginning of the rotation, whether it's mid-rotation and I've never met them before, and it's going to start out by shaking their hand and welcoming them. You know what? Great to have you around today. And then I'm going to find out, you know, what program are you in? Have you been oriented to the department? How long have you been with us? Who have you worked with so far? What med school did you go to? Uh, what did you do before medical school? And, and how many degrees? And actually, that question about how many degrees is important because the last thing that I want to do is ask my med student some question about Starling's forces on the patient that I see with pulmonary edema only to find out that they've got a PhD in cardiac physiology. <laughs> right. um, so all of this really sets the stage to get a good idea of who they are, where they're coming from, and where they're going. And I think actually this one thing about orienting the learner is incredibly actionable for all of our teachers. If you've never done this before, you could try this on your next shift and have a significant impact on your teaching ability. Great. Okay. So you've oriented your learner. The next thing to do is set expectations. And sometimes I find that resident student expectations are kind of all over the map. Dr. Matu, how do you, how do you set expectations for your learners? They are told first up that they're not going to be working on their own. Every time they see a patient, they should make sure that the senior resident and or the attending knows that they're picking up a chart so that they're not going to be in a room for 45 minutes with the STEMI and nobody knows about it. They are told that they should be going into the room, oftentimes with the senior resident or the attending, especially the attending, to be observed. And I guess we can talk more about that in a little bit. And they're also given some instructions about the type of cases that they should be seeing. We tend to be pretty liberal about letting them see most any type of case, but they should be reviewing the triage note with the attending or senior resident before they walk in so that we all know whether it's a high acuity patient, in which case we're going in with them, or whether it's very low acuity, in which case they might get a little bit more freedom. They're told right up front about how they should present the case. You know, presentation may sound kind of self-explanatory, I suppose, but oftentimes they're coming off inpatient rotations where the presentation can be very, very different than what we want in the emergency department much more extensive than what we want in the emergency department. I, I'm not interested you in- might be talking about internal medicine. Yes, yes. <laughs> I am not interested in their mother's age of Minarch or anything else like that. We want a focused presentation. And we also want their presentation to address the fact that they thought about the worst case scenario. And then after they do the history physical, 
they're going to talk about the differential and that should be listed in a worst case first type of scenario. And we can get into that a little bit more also. And they're going to be assessed as well. And they need to know up front how the assessment is going to be based and what they're going to be assessed on. Students really oftentimes surprisingly don't have any idea on many rotations what their assessment is based on. And then they get a bad evaluation and they never knew. It's not fair to them that they never knew what the evaluation was based on. So they're going to be evaluated based on things like work ethic, on their presentation skills, communication skills, and, and, and so on. So they need to be told up front how they're going to be assessed. And then we also tell them up front about the feedback process. Yeah. So that's a lot of stuff to cover in terms of expectations at the beginning of the shift. Dr. Pensner, you have any words of wisdom and how to do that kind of in an efficient way? So remember, when we're orienting the learner, not all of that needs to be front-loaded. So I'm going to start doing that at the beginning of the shift, but I'm going to continue that orientation throughout the first shift, the second shift, whatever my relationship is with that learner, I can continue this. I actually think there's a second part to the expectations, and that is trying to understand what the learner's expectations are, what expectations they have for their rotation. So if this is the beginning of the rotation, I want to ask them, you know, what are your goals and objectives for the rotation? What do you want to get out of this? This might be mid-rotation, and I might ask them, is there something specific that you want feedback on on today's shift? So I think there still are lots of opportunities for us to find out what their expectations are. All right. So that's orientation and expectations, and that segues nicely into diagnosing the learner. Now, besides the various medical problems that your learner may have or may not have, (laughs) what do you mean exactly from a teaching perspective by diagnosing the learner? So Anton, when do you start diagnosing your patients? Well, basically the second I pick up the chart and look at the chief complaint. Okay, so I start diagnosing my patients the minute they walk into the ER. And likewise, I start diagnosing my learners the minute I start talking to them. So diagnosing the learner is all about trying to understand the learner's needs so that I can tailor their teaching. Obviously, the needs of a medical student is going to be very different than an R5. I'll give you an example. If I've just met a med student, I'm going to ask her if she's done any rotations in the ER before. If she tells me that she's done an elective, that tells me, number one, she's interested in eMERGE. It tells me that she can probably suture independently. It tells me that she can probably give a good eMERGE-focused case presentation. If I have an R5 that's nearing their end of their residency, I know that they're going to be focused on writing and passing their exams, and I'm going to do whatever I can during that shift to help support them through that. The next thing I want to talk about is the notion of priming. So prime your learner. So you kind of want to set them up for success in learning. How how do you exactly do you prime your learner? I think priming your learner is primarily for your junior learners, but it can be for anybody. And it is trying to set your learner up for success before a teaching and learning encounter. So for example, if I've got a, a junior learner who's about to see a complex patient who's been in our department many times, before they go in to see the patient, I might encourage them to read the chart before you go in. That's an example of priming. Or I might have a learner and I might direct them to go into the recess room to see that patient who's acutely short of breath and guide them and tell them that, you know what, I want you to think about what you need to do in the first 10 minutes of that encounter. And I'm going to give you 10 minutes in there. No matter where you're at, I want you to come out. I'm going to be right outside the room and come speak to me. So that's an example of priming my learner for the encounter. Yeah, Justin Morgenstern as at first 10 EM would agree with that, I'm sure, wholeheartedly. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's great advice. What oftentimes, if there's time, what I'll try to do is when the student or resident picks up a chart, and really we're talking about students and interns who uh, don't have much experience at this. When they pick up the chart and look at the chief complaint, I'm going to ask them right up front, say they pick up a chart of somebody with upper abdominal pain and a 75-year-old. I want to ask them right up front, when you walk into that room, what do you plan on doing? What do you worry about in a 75-year-old with upper abdominal pain? First of all, it gives you a little bit of chance to perhaps do a little teaching and help them so that when they do go into the room, it's going to be a much more efficient encounter. If time is limited, honestly, what I have found very helpful is a textbook called a five-minute consult. I think 
This is a, an absolutely fantastic book. It's got, and I'm not an author or editor, so I've got no financial incentive to recommend this, but I've been recommending this for at least 15 years now to every new medical student and all the interns also, that when they pick up a chart, if we don't have a chance to talk about the case before they see the patient, I want them to go to that book and just read about the condition before they walk in the room. Every chief complaint, every condition has no more than two pages written in bullet or outline form. And those two pages will cover the history, the physical, the differential, the expected treatment. And it really, really makes the patient encounter much more efficient. So you avoid that scenario of them coming out of the room, presenting the case, and they forgot to ask this question. They forgot to ask that question. Then they have to go back into the room all over again and ask those questions once again. That may happen anyway, but their history, physical, differential, their presentation is much more smooth and they're actually reading up about a case and learning something even before they see the patient. And, you know, as you know, anytime you connect knowledge to an actual patient case, I think it sticks a lot better. So I love this book. I recommend it to all the medical students and interns, and I want to see them reading those two pages about just about every patient before they go in the room. And it really doesn't take more than five minutes. That's the name of the textbook. It's a fantastic book. Yeah. Five minute consult. I do remember that from way back. I mean, only because I know the written summaries for the EM Cases podcast so well, I often refer, you know, a medical student who's about to see someone with a headache. I say, oh, we did an episode on headache. Mm -hmm. Before you go in there, just read through this two, three page summary and then go in and, or for a higher level resident, I might say just from the chief complaint, before you even go in there, I want you to have a differential diagnosis and kind of think through the differential diagnosis before you do anything else. Right. Again, another example of priming. Yeah, there's a lot of online resources. And before somebody goes in and does a procedure, for example, we might pull up the procedure on YouTube and just have them watch it before they actually get into attempting the procedure. So uh, That's little like, things like, like Simpson style, you know, like Dr. Uh, what was his, what's his name? Nick Riviera or something? You know, the doctor on the Sorry, Simpsons? On the Simpsons? On yeah. the Simpsons. Okay. Something like that. You know, he's like, he like has a textbook open as he's performing open heart surgery. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's been done before. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So far, we've talked about orientation, expectations, diagnosing the learner, and priming the learner. So first, orienting the learner. Welcome them. Find out their medical and academic background, program, level of training, experiences, special interests, what they hope to learn from you, and what skills they want to practice. Next is set expectations that they'll be observed at some point during their shift, what types of cases they might see, how you'd like them to present their cases to you, you know, focused, differential diagnosis with the worst case scenario first, however you'd like it, and what they'll be assessed on, receiving specific feedback on their performance. You also want to get a sense of their expectations, what they're hoping to get out of the shift. Also, in terms of setting expectations, encourage them to ask questions. Tell them you'll act like a coach, helping them fine-tune their skills, and encourage them to take an active role in the ED. Get the learner to commit to some learning goals, and finally, provide clear guidelines for charting. After orienting the learner and setting expectations, next is diagnosing the learner. Try to get a sense of the learner's needs so you can tailor your teaching. One of the most common pitfalls is to teach based on a poor understanding of the learner and their needs. And finally, after orientation, setting expectations, and diagnosing the learner, there's priming the learner. Try to set them up for success before they go to see the patient. Encourage them to review the chart, think about the differential, what they think they'll be looking for on history and physical, ask them to read some material or watch a video before they walk into the patient's room. So now that we've talked about orientation, setting expectations, diagnosing the learner, and priming the learner, We're ready to go on to specific teaching strategies. Dr. Matu, as ED docs, we aren't exactly known for our patients. You know, we move quickly and want quick answers from our learners. How is listening rather than telling important in teaching? Sure. Well, as you mentioned, listening is very important. And we are not very good listeners. We're not very good listeners with our patients. We tend to interrupt our patients very frequently. 
and we interrupt our students quite a bit also. So it would be useful to just let your student know up front how much time they have. Usually we give them, we tell them up front that we'd like the presentation to be, say, no more than two, three, four minutes or so. And during those, say, four minutes, as the instructor, you just keep your mouth shut. You let them give the full history and physical. Don't interrupt. Don't try to correct them. Just just let them talk. And oftentimes, they will arrive at the correct diagnosis on their own. Sometimes they won't, but you'll get a much better sense about what's going through their mind without the interruption. I think that's a very, very common mistake that all of us make, especially at the junior faculty level, where we just want to jump in and start correcting them too early. That's number one. Number two, I think it's important to put away all of your stuff. Don't be typing on the computer when they're presenting. Don't be taking notes. Don't be paging someone, but look them in the eye when they are presenting. Give them your your full attention. And people really appreciate that more than anything. I remember one resident at his graduation came up to me at the end and just expressed how thankful he was that when he would present cases to me, I would just sit there and not talk. I would actually look at him and I never really thought about it, but then I started watching a lot of other people when the students were presenting to them and they were always doing something else. And, you know, just in society, it's kind of rude when you're talking to somebody and they are not looking at you, not paying attention. It really shows disinterest. So pay attention to your students when they're talking. Yeah. I mean, that's very similar to a patient interaction. We've done an episode on patient communication and, you know, you want to sit down and look at them in the eye at eye level and give them a chance to speak. And I find even with the patient, sometimes you just let them speak for the first few minutes and they'll, like you said, arrive at the diagnosis. They'll give you the diagnosis on a platter, so to speak, if you just let them talk. Yeah. So, you know, Anton, I'm going to get a little bit geeky on you right now. And that is that philosophically, what our role is there as a teacher I believe very much in what's called the constructivist learning theory. And so that is that our learners in emergency medicine and elsewhere construct their knowledge from the ground up and then through their experiences and reflections on experiences is how they learn. And so our roles as teachers is really to facilitate their learning. Probably the best metaphor of this is that we're coaches. And so it's not about us telling, it's not about us lecturing to them or giving them the information. It's really about facilitating their learning. Yeah, I like that metaphor with the coach. All right. So that was the first principle in terms of when you actually get down to the teaching is listen more and talk less. The second thing I want to talk about is the one minute preceptor. While you know, we need to have patience, we don't have all the time in the world to teach in the ED, as I was saying before. And in teaching around cases, there's this fantastic model called the one-minute preceptor model. Dr. Pensner, can you tell us a little bit about how the one-minute preceptor model can be used in teaching effectively? Sure, Anton. So the one-minute preceptor model's actually been around since about the early 90s and first described by Guy named Nair, and it was used primarily in family medicine and ambulatory settings. And it's been well described for its effectiveness in the clinical setting. And it goes something like this, and, and it works really well in the emergency department. So if I've got a you know junior learner or any learner who's presenting, say, a 25-year-old with a sore throat, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say to her, I want a commitment. What's going on and what do you want to do with that patient? So they might tell me, I think the patient's got strep pharyngitis and I want to put the patient on erythromycin. The second thing that I'm going to do is probe for supporting evidence. So I'm going to say, what on the history and the physical supports that diagnosis? And so they might tell me, patient's got an exudative tonsillitis, a little bit of fever, tender anterior cervical nodes. So number three, I'm going to teach around general rules. So I might say, are you familiar with strep scores? And we can talk about that for a few, for about 30 seconds. And then I want to reinforce what was done right. And I might tell them, I agree with your diagnosis, but then I want to correct mistakes. So I might say that, you know what? Guidelines suggest that we should probably be putting this patient on penicillin and not erythromycin. So that's the one minute preceptor. All right. So just to review that, The one minute preceptor is broken down into five pieces. First, you get a commitment. Then you probe for supporting evidence. Third, you teach general rules. Fourth, reinforce what was right. And then fifth, correct mistakes. You got it. All right. That'd be pretty amazing if you could do that in one minute. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's always been my problem with the one minute preceptor. I think maybe more appropriately, it can be called a five or 10 minute preceptor, especially in a busy emergency department. And gosh, a lot of our patients don't have single chief complaints. And I think this is ideally written for patients that do have one chief complaint. So it is very challenging oftentimes, but to whatever extent you can ask those components and those questions, I think it really makes the, the learning process and teaching process more efficient and effective, but it can be a challenge. But I think actually one of the key things about it is even if you remember nothing else than the first part is actually to force our learners to make a commitment. Start off by saying, what do you think is going on and what do you want to do with this patient? Yeah. And, and that's really important because I'll bet for the listeners right now, if you go back to your emergency departments and just watch some of your colleagues when teaching I'll bet you what you'll find oftentimes is that the student or intern will present the history and then the physical, and then they'll stop. And then the attending will just jump right in without asking them to make a commitment, but they'll just start telling them what to do rather than asking the learner for what they think and what they want to do. It's very, very common. And it fosters this concept that the intern or student is really, or really has no other purpose than to just gather information so that the attending can make all the decisions. And that's really not the way it's supposed to be. They gather all the information, but they should commit themselves to making a decision about what they think the diagnosis is and what they want the plan to be. And just like Rick was saying, the next question is to find out why they think it is so, probe for more information to get an idea whether maybe they got the right diagnosis, but they were just totally guessing at it. Do they actually think through why that diagnosis is correct. The other things that I would add to that, or if time is limited do instead, is to really ask them a lot about what do they think this is not. So starting out with the differential, what, what I like to do when they present is to ask them, what, what are the most deadly possibilities here? And we'll even rank order these, and I'll ask them, what do you think is gonna kill this patient? As an emergency physician, I want them to think of worst case first, and so, what do you think is gonna kill this patient in the next few seconds? What do you think is gonna kill this patient in the next few hours? What do you think is gonna kill this patient in the next few days? And if they can get to that point and the patient's not gonna die in the next few days, you're probably okay, right? So for example, a person comes in with chest pain. What's gonna kill this patient in the next few seconds? Well, arrhythmia or dissection are the things that I would want them listing right up front. What's gonna kill this patient in the next few hours? You can put ACS maybe PE, what's going to kill this patient the next few days, that's where I would want them to put something like pneumonia. But I don't want them putting pneumonia as their number one diagnosis in their differential because that's not the most deadly thing. I want to train their brain to think of most deadly first. And then when they present the case, and in fact, even when they write it up, it should largely be focused not just on what they think is going on, but also I want them to describe why they think it's not something. I've heard oftentimes in risk management, people say that the whole purpose of the chart is not to describe what you think it is, but what you think it's not. Yeah, pertinent negatives. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I, I want them to be able to justify why they don't think it's this or that. So they come up with their differential, let's say chest pain again. The, I always think about the six killers with chest pain are ACS, dissection, PE, pericarditis, tamponade, put those two together, tension pneumo, and esophageal rupture. All right, we'll take those six. And then one by one, I want them to say, well, why do you think it's not tension pneumothorax? Well, the lungs are clear bilaterally. All right, done. Why do you think it's not esophageal rupture? Well, they had no retching or vomiting and they didn't have an endoscopy yesterday. All right, done. Why do you think it's not PE? Now it gets a little bit more complicated. I want them to be able to say, well, there, there is no calf pain or swelling. There's no tachypnea. There's no tachycardia. There's no pleurisy and so on. I want them to be able to justify why it's not any of those killers. And I think that also is a way of probing for their level of knowledge and also training them to think about the worst case scenario. And finally, at the very end, what I will oftentimes do is to ask them to assess themselves after the, the one minute or five minute preceptor of the presentation, what do you think you could have done better? It's very interesting to get their own insights about what they were thinking. I guess we can talk more about that with the feedback, but this is a good time to ask them also. When you were talking to the patient, did you have any problems? What do you think could have gone better? Or what do you think you did really well with that? And it's interesting to get those insights as well. 
So Anton, I don't know if you noticed, but all of those questions that Amal is posing are actually what we call divergent questions and not convergent questions. So they're not a closed-ended question or asking for a list or do you know Ranson's criteria, whatever that is. But they're more about things like, what do you think's going on? Or what else could it be? Or how did you arrive at the diagnosis? And it's interesting because I actually started my career as a teacher, and I think a lot of this have, have done this, asking primarily convergent questions. And now I spend most of my time asking primarily divergent questions. And I'll actually give you an example of that that sort of highlights that. If I'm reviewing with a learner who's just seen a patient with a minor head injury, I might ask them, are you familiar with the Canadian CT head rules? If, or because almost here, the Nexus rules. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're across the board and we'll go with the Canadian rules. Okay. So, so if they say yes, I say great and we can move on. If they say no, I don't ask them what they are and I don't tell them what they are. I suggest that they're going to look it up. And that actually does a couple of things. Number one, I think it actually is a better use of my time because now I can spend more time teaching higher order learning, like problem solving and synthesis and integration and things like that. And number two, it forces them to do some homework that is then going to sort of reinforce their own learning. Yeah, and that's a, a really important tool. If you make the learning interactive and make them actually take an active role in their learning, they're going to remember it a lot more. I think you know, philosophically, I think we do way too much spoon feeding in our, our current teaching environments. We spoon feed the heck out of people. And I, I worry what's going to happen when they no longer have somebody to spoon feed them, they go out on their own. You know, anytime you have interactive learning, it's always much more effective than passive learning. And if you just give them all the answers, you spoon feed them, they're not going to remember it as well as if they had to learn it on their own. And just looking something up on their own is a very simple way of making them take an active role in, in their learning. And I, I don't think we do enough of that. And again, we're there to facilitate their learning, not to tell them or to lecture to them. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a huge sort of paradigm shift. Because I remember when I was training, it was all about pimping. You know, what are the six causes of this? What's the cutoff for X, Y, or Z? And it's really changed a lot. And I think for the better, definitely. The word pimping in and of itself implies something really bad. So I, I don't like that word. It implies also that the faculty member is, in my mind, I think of somebody who's stern and nasty and they are either explicitly or implicitly berating you for not knowing the answer. It doesn't have to be that way. If, if you as a faculty member or teacher are open, engaging, enthusiastic about it, if you don't have a punitive attitude, if somebody doesn't get the answer, if they don't get the answer, but you are still encouraging, then first of all, I wouldn't call it pimping, but, but I think it's a very effective teaching technique to ask the students and learners a lot of questions. And if they don't know the answer, no big deal. You, you help them discover the answer, but it doesn't have to be kind of a confrontational or a negative environment. So I think pimping by itself implies that it's negative, but it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Some, sometimes I'll tell learners at the start of the shift, I'll sort of prime them, is I'll say, I'm going to ask you lots of questions because I think that's a great way to learn. Don't worry if you don't know any of the answers. That's the way you are going to learn. And it's also setting their expectations from the beginning, which is important as well. And asking lots of questions is not about embarrassing the learner. It's about trying to identify gaps in their knowledge. And you're not going to know what those gaps are. You're not going to know what that threshold is unless you've asked lots of questions to the point that they don't know the answer. Yeah. And I like what you said there, um, all about enthusiasm. I mean, I can even reflect on myself, depending on what mood I'm in when I start my shift, even, you know, sometimes I'm incredibly enthusiastic and I'm in a good mood and somehow that often translates into me feeling at the end of the shift, like I've been a good teacher. And conversely, you know, sometimes I'm whatever, I'm tired, I'm in a bad mood. And then I feel at the end of the shift, it's like, man, I, I screwed up that whole teaching encounter because I was you know, I wasn't enthusiastic. So, um, yeah, I totally agree that enthusiasm, I mean, just that simple thing, enthusiasm can take you a long way. I mean, if you're excited about something, your, your learner is going to be excited about that same thing.
let's continue talking a little bit more about questioning techniques. We've touched on a few different things here. What are some of the pitfalls you see? So I think the number one pitfall that both I'm guilty of, but I observe my colleagues doing is not waiting long enough after they ask a question before they're waiting for that answer. So we all hear about wait times in the emergency department. So wait times in the emergency department actually has nothing to do with how long our patients are waiting. So wait times are actually the length of time after we ask a question of our learners before we start speaking again. And interestingly, there's actually been over 50 years of wait time literature and studies that all says the same thing over and over again. And and these have been replicated in classroom, across all cultures, across all levels. Anton, do you know how long, on average, a teacher waits after they ask a question before they start speaking again? I'm gonna guess three seconds. Less than one second. And what the literature says, and it's been replicated over and over again, is that all you need to do is extend that to at least three seconds. That's it. And you'll actually get longer answers, more in-depth answers with more logic. The challenge is, is that in spite of all sorts of teacher development and faculty development, it's actually very hard to train teachers to do that. But all you need to do is wait at least three seconds, preferably longer, and we'll start hearing our learners answer more. So you got to kind of hold yourself back, especially when, if they're having trouble or I find it gets to sometimes a bit uncomfortable. You know, I ask a question and they're kind of struggling and they're kind of struggling and I kind of want to give them the answer. But often if I just tell myself, you know, just shut up and let them think a bit more. And then suddenly they come out with this brilliant answer. As Amal mentioned before, this is actually generalizable to the way we interact with our patients also. So, you know, we we need to be modeling for our learners, but when we ask our patients a question on history, we also need to wait for that response back from our patients and not interrupt them. Interruptions has become kind of a pet peeve. When I'm talking to a consultant, when I'm talking to a colleague, when I'm trying to teach something, when I'm asking a question to students or residents and they interrupt me, it really angers me. And so there's no reason why it shouldn't anger them if I interrupt them as well. And I think if you start paying attention to the number of interruptions, then at the very least, just being aware of it, it'll make you better. It's really interesting. If if during a busy shift, you just watch two emergency physicians talk to each other, neither one of them ever finishes a sentence. They just talk right over top of each other. It's, and once you start noticing it, it'll start annoying you and you'll, you'll stop doing it. But I think people are just not aware that they're doing it. It just becomes such a habit, maybe in our society, maybe in emergency medicine or in a busy environment, but you've got to let people finish what they're saying with patients also and also with the learners. Just let them talk for God's sakes. All right. I want to talk about something called active observation. You know, it seems to me that with each passing decade, we do less and less real bedside teaching, you know, the kind where you're literally at the bedside with the learner. And we rarely get to see our learners taking a history or doing a physical. I think there's a lot of value in observing your learner in action. So Dr. Pensner, what is active observation and how can we use active learning in a busy ED to teach well? So Anton, do you remember what Yogi Berra said? You can observe a lot just by watching. So if you think about it, most of our interactions with our learners are during their case presentation. Actually, can I interrupt? You (laughs) didn't actually give him three seconds to answer your questions. (laughs) (laughs) He would have come up with the answer, I'll bet. Rick, I'm going to take it back. You're not a master educator. (laughs) You've got a lot to learn about educating. Thank you for the feedback. (laughs) I just just learned that from you. You're a good learner, Rick. You're you're thanking him for your feedback. You taught me something already. So, so, so if you think about it, most of our interactions with our learners are during the case presentation. So what we're actually able to give feedback on and assess our learners on is their case presentation. And it tells us nothing about their abilities to take a history, perform a physical examination, perform a procedure. We need to do a better job observing our learners, so much so that this has become a medical school accreditation requirement to observe our learners. 
And so I actually use a technique that I refer to as sampling observation. Sampling observation. Okay. Yeah. Let's hear about that. So, so I don't think that we have the time or that we need to observe our learners from start to finish, complete history and physical examination, but I'm going to do some sampling. I might listen to a learner through the curtain as they interact with a patient. I might watch part of a procedure that gives me a good idea of how they're doing that procedure because I'm sampling. I might return with that learner to the patient to the bedside, verify some elements of the case presentation, and then ask the learner, can you show me how you checked for sensation of L4, L5, S1 dermatome? I might return with the learner to the patient in the bedside and actually ask them to give the discharge instructions while I'm there. So that gives me an exam, an opportunity to observe through sampling of different aspects of their encounters. It has been quite eye-opening the number of times over the years where we've had, for example, students who just give flawless presentations. They seem perfect, but then you start getting these patient complaints about their interaction when they were in the room, they're condescending or arrogant, or they continually interrupted or whatever. And then on the other hand, we've also seen it the complete opposite where the student or intern is not necessarily really great with their presentation skills, but they have just wonderful bedside manner and, and the patients and their families just love them. And I would much rather have the latter example of a resident because I can teach them presentation skills. We can teach them presentation skills. It's awfully tough to teach better behavior after 26 years of upbringing. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'd much rather focus on the person who's got excellent bedside skills, but you never know that because you're not in the room with them. So that's something that we've worked on. I do it often, but not enough. Some of my colleagues do it 90% of the cases that they see. I'm probably under 50%, but I think there's uh, there's a lot of really eye-opening information that you get when you're in the room and also a different type of feedback that you can give them as well. All right. So when it comes to teaching around case presentations, we've talked about listening more than talking. We've talked about the one-minute preceptor model, different questioning techniques and pitfalls. We've talked about active observation. Any other tips and tricks for teaching on the fly? So I'm going to, I'm going to jump in here and it may not be exactly what you were asking for, but it's certainly around teaching strategy around case presentations. Because one of the things that I actually do when the learner is presenting is the first thing I do is I take the chart away from them and I actually ask them to present the case without reading their notes. This does two things. It's incredible how it transforms their presentation from one of reading a laundry list of these pertinent positives and negatives to telling a story. It humanizes the patient because so much of what we do in emergency medicine is storytelling. It's patients telling us a story, us telling consultants a story. So I think it's a really important skill to have. The second thing that it does is that it forces our learners to actually learn how to present a case without reading their notes. Something that we do all the time when we're speaking to consultants in the hallway or speaking to consultants on the phone. So that's one strategy that I think is really valuable with the case presentation. Great one. Love it. Dr. Matsu? There's a couple of things that I like to do. One of my favorite teaching techniques is what I refer to as the what if, whereby after the presentation is given, it may not always be the most interesting patient presentation, but no matter how mundane a patient presentation starts out, you can al always make it interesting by throwing out a what if. What if this patient suddenly crashed? What would you do? What if after you intubated that patient, they suddenly developed a PEA arrest. What's your differential for, what are the things that can produce a post-intubation PEA arrest? What if this patient suddenly developed hypotension? What would you do? What if this patient with asthma suddenly crashed? What would be your indications for intubation? So no matter how plain and simple and dare I say boring a patient presentation may be, by throwing out a what if, you can really make it a much more interesting case. It's a lot of fun for the student. It's fun for me. And you know that in the emergency department at some point, they're gonna face that scenario of the patient who just suddenly heads downhill. 
you can do it with medications. You, let's say you've got a person who comes in, you know, they come in with a paronychia. That's it. There's not a whole lot of interest to talk about. But you happen to notice on the chart that the patient's on prednisone for rheumatoid arthritis, completely unrelated. Well, you can say to the resident, you know, notice this patient's on prednisone chronically. What if this patient presented, not with the perinicia, but what if they presented with hypoglycemia and they're a bit hypotensive? What does that mean to you? And you want to see whether they can pick up adrenal insufficiency. You know, let's say you have a 26-year-old woman who was lifting some heavy boxes and came in with some low back pain, and she happens to have a blood pressure of 150 over 90. Well, that's no big deal. She's got pain. She probably just needs something for pain. Well, what if that 26-year-old woman with the low back pain were 36 weeks pregnant? How would that change? Well, now that resident needs to pick up the fact that that blood pressure suddenly is really, really important because this is a patient who's 36 weeks pregnant. So you can turn relatively mundane cases into things that are much more interesting by just throwing out the what if. And suddenly now you have a 30 second opportunity to talk about eclampsia or preeclampsia or the post intubation crash or whatever it is. So that's one of the things that I really like doing. What if, what right. if, yeah, you can make anything interesting Yeah, and it, it should be interesting. And eventually, as I mentioned, that resident is going to run into that case and they're going to be just a little bit more prepared because they have talked about it before. Mm -hmm. I use it all the time on the podcast. Yeah, there you when go. I'm interviewing <laughs> you guys. What if? What if? Yeah. What if you have a disinterested learner? So I guess <laughs> yeah. we'll get to that. The other thing that I like doing that I've, I've started doing over the past several years is something that I like to refer to as sniper rounds. We'll oftentimes run the board several times during the shift just to get updates on plans with all of the patients. Well, when we run the board, what I like to do is to just ask a quick question with every patient, one question per patient, one pearl per patient. And we have a nice big grease board that we bought specifically for this reason with dry erase markers. And at the start of my shift, I'll write the room numbers for all the patients I'm responsible for. And then whenever we run the board, we need to write down one pearl for every patient that's listed on that board. And we do that when we run the board. So you know, a couple times a shift, we run the board just to get updates. And rather than just saying, all right, this patient's well, waiting on labs and then we're going to discharge. Next patient, this patient's waiting on a consultant call. No, why don't we just take 30 seconds with every patient, 20 seconds, and just say, all right, this patient's going to be admitted for um, asthma, bad asthma. What if this patient, I might ask at the intern level, what if this patient suddenly crashed and needed to be intubated? Uh, as an intern, I want them to know what, what if this patient needs to be intubated, what drugs would you use? I might ask the senior resident, what if this patient needed to be intubated and then crash? What would you be thinking about? So I, you can vary the questions based on their level of learning. And then you just write the pearl on the board also. Mm -hmm. um, are, are those the whiteboard, the whiteboard pearls, pearls that you tweet out exactly, sometimes that exactly. get like 700 likes and retweets? <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. So that's, those are what the sniper rounds are. With every patient, we try to come up with one pearl and we write it down on the board. Writing it on the board is something separate, but I think it's very important. You know, in, in learning, they talk about the fact that when you hear something, you remember about 25%. So you remember about 25% of what you hear. You remember about 50% of what you see and hear. And thus was the birth of PowerPoint several decades ago. And you remember probably about 75% of what you see, hear, and do. So by writing it down on the board, the residents and students have a chance to see it written and hear it. And then the other thing is that it stays up during the course of the shift. So every time they walk by the board, they look at it and they get reminded of a pearl. The people on the other side of the emergency apartment, we have double cover. So the other attending who has other residents to work with, they see us writing pearls on the board and there's a certain amount of peer pressure. So they start feeling like they got to do a little more teaching. The other residents see it. We'll have nurses come walking into the dock area, paramedics come walking in the dock area. They'll look at all the pearls that are written on the board and it becomes kind of a phenomenon of everybody being interested in writing things down. And then we'll take it one step further. I'm guilty of not doing this often enough, but sometimes I'll, I do and probably we need to do it more often. If you remember 75% of what you see here and do, we'll make the resident or student write the pearl on the board. And just the very fact that they're writing it down themselves will increase the retention as well. So that's something that I've, I've started doing a lot over the past several years. And, and I think it's, it's really made things more fun. And on those days when I show up for a shift where I truly am not enthusiastic, I'm tired, I'm frustrated about something, I'm not enthusiastic about teaching, 
I will still nevertheless come in for that shift and I'll write all the room numbers on the board. And it forces me to have to teach at least one Perl for every patient. Otherwise, I'm just going to have this blank board with numbers staring at me the entire shift. So it puts some pressure back on me to do the teaching and also on the senior resident. So I think it's a very, very effective teaching tool. Yeah, fantastic. I know uh, a variation on the whiteboard teaching is the sticky note teaching. Mm-hmm. I think academic life in emergency medicine. Yeah, uh, Michelle Lynn started doing that as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you don't have a whiteboard in your department, you can just get a pad of sticky notes and find a blank wall in a private area and you can put your pearls on the sticky notes. So I think, you know, in the emergency department, we obviously have incredible competing demands, but also as eMERGE physicians, we are masters of time management. And I think there are lots of things we can do around teaching that are strategies to manage those busy demands. First of all, you know, we've talked about the importance of teaching. I think that when we are busy, there's nothing wrong with limiting one teaching point to one case. Anton, have you ever had a junior learner or any learner who was so deficient in their knowledge after their case presentation that you just didn't know where to start. Oh yeah. I can think of a few right off the top of my head. So I think that again, we need to unburden ourselves. It is not our responsibility to ensure that our learner learns everything they need to know about emergency medicine on that one shift. Limit your teaching to very sort of small snippets And once you unburden yourself of that, you'll actually be much more effective teacher with those challenging learners. I also think in terms of being efficient, that we've got incredible team in the emergency department and we should be utilizing other team members for our teaching. So I will often ask the nurse to work with the learner on how to put on a triangular bandage or a tube dressing, or I might have the orthopedic technologist, you know, show the learner how to put on a cast. I think there are incredible opportunities of utilizing team members and teaching in the emergency department. Teaching procedural skills is a whole different kettle of fish, really, compared to teaching knowledge-based material. Dr. Matu, how do you suggest we teach learners procedural skills? It's not the old see one, do one, teach one anymore. So <laughs> yeah. not, certainly not in the interest of patient safety. We will sit them down at the computer, pull up YouTube or Robertson Hedges and have them watch the procedure. After that, we'll discuss with them. And actually, I think it's helpful to ask them then to describe, without looking at pictures, describe to us what they're going to do. Describe back the procedure. So that they- Talk it through. Talk it through. And with the procedure, because there are risks if they do something wrong, as soon as anything happens where maybe they're pointing the needle in the wrong direction or whatever- Now, this isn't the time where you let them make a mistake and then teach them afterwards. It's not simulation. This is a time where as soon as you see them maybe pointing the wrong direction or maybe they didn't do this or that, you immediately correct the action. So again, that's why I say you figuratively walk them through the procedure. But I I think that the availability of online resources has really made life a whole lot easier. So that's typically what we'll do. So Amal, you mentioned about how you get the learner to describe back the procedure. I think related to that, there's actually benefit and there's probably some evidence for it also, for its effectiveness about visualizing the procedure that you're going to be doing, particularly if it's a rare procedure. So it's fine to practice it in the sim lab or in a workshop, but there's a lot of value in asking our learners and for us to do it ourselves to start visualizing what all the steps are for that procedure and exactly taking you through and possibly even complications and how you might deal with it. Yeah, it's like the basketball players who uh, visualize shooting the free throws, and then uh, that actually helps them increase their likelihood of getting that basketball in the net. All right, let's go on to the next case. (laughs) You've just finished a busy clinical day with a first-year family medicine resident, and the resident works quietly at an adequate pace. Your impression is that the resident has some difficulty making a decision and can't really commit to a plan. Even with simple cases, the resident presented the history and physical, but never volunteered a plan of attack. When asked, they usually say, I'm not sure, or provide a series of disorganized management options, some of which make sense and some of which don't. So you decide to focus on this issue during your feedback session at the end of the clinic. So Dr. Pensner, let's talk about feedback. First of all, why is feedback so important? So Anton, first of all, without feedback, 
learning does not occur. It closes the loop on our teaching. And, you know, I think it's important, first of all, to consider the definition of framework, at least in this context. And that is about providing information to our learners in order to improve performance, future performance. And once we frame it like that, it takes out all the concepts of negative feedback and constructive feedback and positive feedback. It's all about improving their future performance. And what's interesting though, is that when you actually ask our students and the literature supports this with lots of studies, you know, are you getting enough feedback? The answer is no. And when you ask our faculty, are you giving feedback? They say, we're giving lots of feedback. And so the truth actually probably lies somewhere in the middle. We probably can do a better job giving feedback, but I also think that when we give the feedback, it would help if we label it as such. So do you mean when, when you have your feedback sessions, you essentially announce to them, let's do some feedback? Absolutely. Okay. I, yeah, I think that that's really important. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes you have to do that with teaching also, because many of the learners don't realize how much they're actually learning along the way. Because nowadays, most medical students learn when they are sitting in front of giant PowerPoint slides in a lecture hall. And when they don't get that experience in the emergency department, they don't realize how much learning is actually happening. So sometimes you have to label it and announce it, hold up cardboard signs that say it's feedback time and make sure that they understand it. I think that's really important. I think most physicians out there can relate to this. I find it really difficult to give constructive feedback without making the learner feel badly or sounding like a jerk sometimes. In this case, we're talking about there's, there's a lot of issues with this learner. Like what kind of things do you say to make it so that you don't actually make them feel bad, that it's a constructive thing that for them to learn better? Well, I don't want to sound hardcore, but your goal is to make them better not necessarily to make them feel good which isn't to say that you want to be overly negative about things. But remember that as a coach, your job is to give them the feedback that they need to hear, not what they want to hear. You know, it's similar to being a parent. You know, I tell my kids what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. If I just left it up to the, what they want, they'd be eating Skittles and ice cream for dinner every night, right? <laughs> but I think one thing that makes it easier for me and one thing that would make it easier for you and other faculty is to just let them know at the start of a shift that at the end of the shift, I promise you that I'm going to give you positive as well as constructive criticism. I'm going to tell you something that you did well, and I'm also going to tell you a couple of things that I think you need to work on. And if they know from the beginning, if they expect that to happen, then they generally don't take it in a negative way because they're expecting it to happen. In fact, they are waiting for you to tell them. And if you don't give it to them, then they feel shortchanged. So I think a lot of faculty oftentimes are afraid to give, we'll say negative feedback or constructive criticism because they don't wanna make the person feel bad. But if that person knows it's coming, they're not gonna feel bad, they're expecting it. So I, I think just giving them that expectation from the start can oftentimes make it a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, there's so many times in this podcast, we've already been talking about expectations. You know, so much of this stuff comes back to prepping them and getting them to expect everything that's going to be happening. And then it just makes life so much easier for the rest of the shift. So if, if I had to give some advice to a teacher about giving difficult feedback, I'd say that be honest and authentic. And if you have to give difficult feedback, I'm going to sit down with the learner and I'm going to say, I need to give you some difficult feedback. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this. And frame it as feedback, not about evaluation and assessment. So I leave the evaluation and the assessment to other people. That's, you know, program directors, site supervisors. My job is to improve your performance. And when you frame it like that, you know, everyone just sort of relaxes a little bit that I'm genuinely interested in your success. Mm, I like that. I'm giving you this feedback to make you better. Great. Okay. I mean, yeah, some of the other things with feedback is you want to be as objective as possible. I mean, I've overheard other docs giving feedback where it almost sounds like they're saying personal things that are, are negative. So you don't want to personalize the feedback either. You know, it's the same thing with parenting. You never tell your kid, you're a bad kid. You would say, what you did was bad. You shouldn't have done what you did. Same thing, just like with the student. You're not going to say, you're a bad student, but 
you should have done something a little bit different. So you're not making a personality judgment. You're not making a character judgment. You're evaluating a behavior and not the person. There's lots of frameworks out there on how to give effective feedback and you'll never remember them. (laughs) And they're all effective. What I usually start with is the self-assessment. So I'm going to ask the learner, how do you think you're doing? How did you do today? And, and this actually does a number of things. First of all, it takes the burden off of us and the learner starts talking and they're usually much more critical of themselves than we are of, of them, but it gets things moving. And it, it sort of, I find relaxes and starts the conversation going after that, I want to be as objective as I can and describe what I observed. And then I'm going to probably describe the sort of ideal behavior. And I'm usually going to couch it more of, this is not the way I like to do things, but I might say, you know, most of my colleagues usually do it like this or best practices like this. And then I'm often going to want to make sure that they understand the gap, the difference between what they did, what I observed and what the ideal behavior is. But I want to think about an actionable item. So then I'm going to come up with a little bit of plan. Maybe next time it might be better if you do it like this. And why don't we follow up on that? you know, after your next case or next shift. Can you give us an example? Yeah. So, you know, if it's around what we were talking about before of interrupting our patients, maybe they're asking close-ended questions and they're not giving the patients an opportunity to give an answer. I might suggest to them that, you know what, I observed as I was listening through the curtain that you were asking these rapid fire questions of this, of this patient and the patient was getting, you know, exceedingly frustrated you know, generally, most people find that if you ask a open-ended question and wait a few seconds, you'll actually get the patient talking and after about 30 seconds, they might start. And then I might make sure they understand the difference between, you know, the way that you ask questions and the way that I just described. And then I might suggest, why don't with your next two or three patients go in and ask the question, what brings you to hospital today and just wait. And then you know what? At the end of the shift, we can follow up and see how that went. Recently, I've started doing this thing where I ask the learner for feedback on my feedback. So we do a kind of a whole feedback session at the end and they say, well, you know, can you give me feedback on my feedback? And then the ones that are funny usually say, and then I'll give you feedback on your feedback that I've given you feedback on. <laughs> so, so Anton, actually what you're describing is, is a great technique to become a better teacher, is asking our learners. And generally there requires a degree of trust with our learners to do this, but asking our learners, how did I do today? Or can you give me some feedback on my teaching? Or as you said, can you give me some feedback on my feedback that I'm giving you? All right, before we leave feedback, I want to ask about the Sackett sandwich that is the providing positive feedback followed by negative feedback and then finishing with positive feedback. I mean, I remember this was the way I was taught to give feedback when I started as faculty. Is that an effective way of giving feedback? What do you think about the whole sandwich thing? It comes by many different names, some of which are uh, not very flattering. This uh, positive, yeah. negative, positive, which we won't, I guess, say. <laughs> right, because then on iTunes, there'll be uh, an explicit flag on on our podcast. For sure. I don't think it's necessary to do that. And I think it is well known enough that a lot of students will see through it. I think it's actually problematic. And it's something that we're trying to move away from. Because as you said, Amal, it's predictable. And the learner is waiting like, here it comes. I just got my positive feedback. And now the negative feedback's about to come. And what ends up happening is if that so-called negative feedback is some very critical feedback that you need to give, it just gets lost. And that's because you couched it in these other things and they actually missed the whole point that you really wanted to ensure that so-called negative or constructive feedback was lost on them. Dr. Pensner, are there any other things that you or your learner can do at the end of a shift after you've given your feedback or even after the shift to augment learning? So some of the things that I do at the end of the shift is again, I go through the list of patients that we saw and I will, will reiterate the teaching points, one teaching point on on each patient. I try to use a little bit of an appreciative inquiry approach. When I ask them, you know, tell me something that you did well today. And then I'm actually going to ask them, tell me something that you would do differently next shift as a result of today's shift. And then I'll actually finish it off often with, tell me one thing that you learned today. I think that's great. 
after the whiteboard teaching is done, I, I will oftentimes tell the residents and especially the students that at the end of the shift, I'm going to erase everything off the whiteboard and I want them to write three pearls that they learned today. And it can be stuff that they learned from me, from the senior resident, from the other attending, from the nurses, paramedic, for anything. And by having them write it down, once again, it makes it just a little bit more interactive. And, and I hope it solidifies their memory of those pearls a little bit better also. Yeah. And then there's, you know, reading around cases, of course. I think most uh, students find that really useful. All right. So the very last question is, what makes a great teacher in general? And what do you do personally to improve your teaching skills? I mean, you guys don't need much improvement at all in your teaching skills, but what have you done in the past to improve your teaching skills? And what, what makes a great teacher? So I think a great teacher is someone who is passionate and enthusiastic in what they do. So that's both in their clinical care and in their teaching and someone who shows a genuine interest and respect for the learner. You know, in our department, we have some master teachers and I learn a lot just by listening and watching them teach and then trying to copy some of their things. I try different things. I fall flat on my face a few times and then as, as Amal said, I spend a lot of time thinking about my teaching, talking to my colleagues about my teaching and talking to the learners about my teaching. And, and I agree with what Amal has to say that I've got a long way to go and a lot to improve in my teaching. At this point in the podcast, I'd like to invite my friend, the co-conspirator for the podcasting course, an ED doc who's literally been changing the world of medical education through the great med ed work that he does, Dr. Rob Rogers. I invited Rob to speak at the EMU conference this year, which, by the way, we're planning on launching the best of EMU talks video series on EM cases this year. Anyway, we tried to nail down a time that he could join in the roundtable discussion with Rick and Amal, but we couldn't quite make it happen. So instead, I just asked Rob to record a few minutes of his highest yield teaching on shift pearls. So take it away, Rob. Thanks for having me back on the podcast, Anton. It is indeed my pleasure. I'll try to add a couple of things that I think might work when it comes to teaching in a busy emergency department. You know, there's a couple of things I've noticed over the years. Uh, the most important one is it's getting really tough to teach. And if you work in a busy place like I do, most of you do, it's it's just really tough to find time to take residents up to a whiteboard or to the bedside or to teach a procedure with a group. It's becoming more and more difficult. And so at least what I the way I think about it is are there ways around this that will, you know, pretty much still provide great education and motivation for learners you're working with. One of the things that I've been doing for years and I think Amal Matu actually taught me this, or at least I saw him role model this when I was a resident, is any case that's presented by a student, resident, advanced practice provider, you know, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, anybody who's presenting a case to you, you can turn that into any other kind of case. And here's an example. A medical student or an intern presents a patient with an ankle sprain, run-of-the-mill ankle sprain, no big deal. And as an educator, you're sort of struggling with, oh my gosh, what am I going to teach? I don't want to teach about ankle sprains. This is the 15th ankle sprain of the day. But you can turn that into a great teaching opportunity in a very little amount of time by simply saying, what if this was you know, a 50-year-old female who was taking ciprofloxacin for a UTI? And then you turn that what-if case into an Achilles tendon rupture or or whatever other injury you can think about. If an asthmatic comes in, with a severe asthma exacerbation, you might say to an upper level resident or registrar, what if this asthmatic needs to be intubated? What drugs would you use? Or what if you intubate them and they lose a pulse? I mean, you can, you can use this what if approach throughout your entire shift and not even actually have that patient in your emergency department. You can have a cellulitis patient and you might say, what if this patient had some bulli and they were uh, altered, you know, they looked really, really sick, or they were diabetic. And then you talk about necrotizing fasciitis. And so you can talk about the rule out worst case scenario, the worst of the worst, the things you can't miss, the pearls, the pitfalls that we all love to teach about. You can do that by simply saying, what if this happens? And I love that approach. 
The other thing, which I think is an often forgotten aspect of being a good educator, because I just don't think we talk about it and I don't think we think about it as an actual teaching modality or teaching strategy, and that's simply how to be a good role model, how you behave with consultants, how you talk to nurses, how you talk with residents, and so forth. You're, you're, you're being an educator by doing that. So I think role modeling appropriate behavior is a, is a great thing uh, to do. The other thing is post-shift education. I think most of us think, well, the shift is over, I'm going home. And, and that's great. That's normal to go home and to, to not think about your shift. But one simple thing you can do, and I noticed this with residents who I work with at the University of Kentucky, is the, most of the residents, all the residents are on Snapchat. And uh, despite you know the number of people who make fun of me for being on Snapchat, I'm also on Snapchat. And so I noticed that you know maybe this is a way to get educational pearls to a group of residents. And so what, what I've been doing, sometimes during the shift, if it's slower, but definitely after or before or even a day when I'm not working, I'll send an appropriate privacy protected image, you know, usually an ECG or a CT scan or something like that. And I'll post it to a group on Snapchat that I connect with and it go, only goes to those people. And, they, you know, you can put little words up there. You can send only text if you like. You can send videos. You have to be careful, obviously, with privacy issues. But it's a great way to connect with that group pre and post shift. And you're educating. Remember, as an educator, your role goes way beyond just teaching during shifts. During shifts is great and that's important. But you can teach before your shift. You can teach during your shift. You can teach after your shift. You can actually, by sending a quick email or text message or getting on Snapchat or whatever platform we're talking about, you can be an educator all the time. You know, and personally, I think that is our full time job is to, to to think about ways to educate beyond the shift because we are full time educators. And the last thing I'll I'll end with is something that that I've done, and I, I sort of have to catch myself sometimes is when and when an intern or a student presents a case. You know, it's a busy shift. You've got a lot of patients to see, a lot of sick patients. And then up comes a medical student who wants to present a case of, I don't know, an ankle sprain or cellulitis or something simple or a chest pain patient. Or an intern has the same thing. And sometimes your reflex action, because you're in hyperdrive, you're, you know, you're, you're going fast and you've got a lot to do, is to interrupt their presentation and say, let's say it's a chest pain patient, for example, to interrupt them and say, you know what, I think you should get a chest x-ray, ECG, troponin, give them an aspirin and call cardiology. And that student or intern is just sitting there looking at you like, okay, uh, I can do that. And then off to the next patient. That's not education. Now, when it's busy and stuff's hitting the fan, you may have to direct where things go, but just make sure you come back to that case because that's a missed opportunity Really, uh, and I think this is also true for volunteers, uh, you know, high school students, college students um, who aren't even in medical school, who come observe. They're there, like for example, where I work, we have an observer program where students come to just watch us. And just remember what it was like when you were in that stage of your life, and you were fascinated by by being in the emergency department, and everything was fresh and new and fascinating and just unbelievable. And, you know, like to see an abscess drained was like, oh my gosh, this is an abscess. I get to see an abscess drained. All of those things are exciting to these learners. And so don't forget to take care of their basic needs, like teaching them the differential diagnosis, talking to them. It takes time. And I think for me personally, I've had to like have this little discussion inside my head, like make sure you spend some time with these people, even if it's 10, 20, 30 seconds or a minute or two, and just chat them up uh, because it's tough to be there in the emergency department as an observer. Now, for medical students and residents, it, particularly the interns, make sure you address basic stuff, how to think, how to go through a differential diagnosis, how to order certain things, um, and get them thinking about cases as opposed to just listening to a presentation and saying, okay, that sounds good. But just make sure you spend time uh, even if it's a little bit of time, spend some time with them showing that you care about their education. Because ultimately, if you really think about it, the people you teach today may very well be the people who take care of us tomorrow or our loved ones. And so do it with care. Do it with, not to sound corny, but do it with love. Do it like you actually care about the skills you're teaching them 
because it's important because someday they will be the providers who take care of us. And, you know, you better hope you taught them well. You better hope you motivated them and inspired them to be the very best they could be. Just remember what you teach, how you teach, and how you motivate and inspire matters. To wrap it up, to our listeners who are educators, I hope you gained a few new tools, maybe some new approaches, maybe even a renewed enthusiasm for what is undoubtedly a significant part of your job. And to our listeners and learners, we could probably do an entirely separate podcast on how to learn well on Shift. But I hope you took this time to see sort of the other side of the coin the challenge your preceptors have, and hopefully you have a new appreciation for yet another dimension of what it means to be a practicing physician. So with that, I'd like to thank you both so much for your time and your expertise and your knowledge and your wisdom. Dr. Matu, thanks so much. Thanks for having us. And Dr. Pensner, you just killed it, man. Thank, thanks for having me, Anton. <laughs> All right. And I'll leave you with the quote of the month. This one's from Sir William Osler, which I think probably three quarters of the quotes of the month have been William Osler. One second. Amal, do you know that William Osler was born just north of Toronto? I didn't know that, no. And and obviously he went to McGill Medical School before he went down south to John Hopkins. Yeah, I I knew about McGill, but I didn't know that he was born in these parts. Yeah, in, in Bondhead, Ontario, I believe. So here it comes from Sir William Osler. In the hurly burly of day to day, When the competition is so keen, it is well for young people to remember that no bubble is so iridescent or floats longer than that blown by the successful teacher. (laughs) 